high atop the white mountains of the Inyo National Forest in the Eastern Sierra stand the oldest trees in the world, the Great Basin Bristlecone Pines. Some of these trees are over 4,000 years old and still growing. These ancient sentinels are the oldest living things on Earth. They have also provided us with the key to unlocking major historical and scientific questions. I just love to be amongst these old trees. Many times somebody says, think about a serene spot and a place where you're at peace. I think about uh, the ancient Briscoe Pines. They are older than the pyramids. They're older than the first writing. They're older than all but the very first villages that humans ever made. It's unbelievable in some cases to think how old that wood is and how long it's been there and how much longer it's going to be there, too. As glaciers retreated from the last ice age some 10 to 12,000 years ago, bristlecone pines began their slow migration up the slopes of the White Mountains. No longer confined by cold temperatures to the valleys and lowlands, these pines colonized the canyons and upper elevation slopes in the Great Basin. The lowest slopes of the White Mountains are a desert scrub environment, while stands of pinyon juniper forest blanket the mid-elevations. Bristlecone and limber pines dominate the subalpine zone, while only the hardiest plants can survive the alpine zone. In this extreme environment, plants and animals must adapt or die. Limber pines protect themselves from the debilitating wind by growing in a low-lying form known as crumholtz. But the bristlecone pines seem to taunt the wind and cold with their majestic, distinctive form on this sparse landscape. The bristlecone pine have the unique ability to continue to live on, on a very thin strip of bark that may go up the side of the tree and then out to a living branch. Any other tree that loses uh, half or two thirds of its bark is gonna be opened up for insect penetration and disease and will ultimately die. The bristlecone pine seem to be able to slough off pieces of bark and yet live for hundreds if not thousands of years on these small pieces of strip bark. With very poor moisture, poor soil, up here at 10,000 feet where the winds come through here, 100 miles per hour, blowing sharp sand and ice crystals, tearing against these trees, they have a very difficult environment, uh, certainly. Bristlecone pines grow so slowly, they need a nearly competition-free environment to germinate and survive. Using this challenging landscape to their advantage, these timberline ancients continue to inspire awe at their longevity. The bristlecone pine comes from the foxtail family of pines, known for their unique arrangement of needles along the branch, similar to the hair on a foxtail. There are two species of bristlecone pines, each having a prominent prickle or bristle on the cone. The Great Basin bristlecone pine, Pinus longeva, is found only in the eastern Sierra and parts of Nevada and Utah while the Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine, Pinus aristata, is found only in the Rocky Mountain states of Colorado, New Mexico, and one isolated part of Arizona. With a growing season as short as 45 days, bristlecone pines faithfully record each year of growth with a narrow tree ring. It usually takes 100 growth rings to make up an inch of trunk width. Wider rings generally indicate a time when moisture from rain and snow was more plentiful, whereas a pattern of narrower rings indicates a period of drought. 
These growth patterns have provided a window to historic environmental conditions spanning several millennia. Along with his many other accomplishments, Leonardo da Vinci was the first to observe that varying tree ring widths may correspond to changes in precipitation. But it was 600 years later that an entire new branch of science was developed, dendrochronology, the study of tree rings. We are always engaged in trying to reconstruct history. And there are many, many ways of going back and looking at when things occurred in the past, especially things for which there are no written records. And then when I insert... Using an increment borer, scientists can extract a small cross-section of a living tree without damaging the tree. I back it out. That will break the core off. And here is our core. We bring that piece of wood back in to the lab, and we do our plot. We find where it fits. By overlapping and matching the patterns of the tree ring records, scientists can date the trees. This time-consuming technique of comparing tree ring records is known as cross-dating. Each vertical line represents one ring. When I come to a ring that is smaller than the others, I will draw a line. So the lines represent the really dry years. As unlikely as it seems, an astronomer from Vermont, Andrew Ellicott Douglas, is credited with founding dendrochronology in the early 1900s. I want you to meet a man who knows more about trees than anyone in the world. Dr. Andrew E. Douglas at the University of Arizona. <laughs> Doctor, how old was this log when it was cut? Tom, that tree was 466 years old when it was cut. It was cut in the year 477 A.D., which was 1,472 years ago. Dr. Douglas had a theory that the uh, solar flares would cause slight weather variations here on the Earth. Those weather variations, in turn, would be recorded in tree ring patterns. And he did thousands and thousands of increment bores, and he really developed a tremendous database and an expertise in tree ring dating. While Douglas was never able to prove his astronomy theory, his decades of work in tree ring dating led to the development of the science of dendrochronology and later to one of the most significant advances of the century in archaeology, the dating of Indian ruins at Pueblo Bonito. For years, historians and archaeologists struggled to date the development and subsequent abandonment of hundreds of Native American ruins in the Southwest. Through Douglas's tree ring pattern that he was able to increment bore some beams in some abandoned Native American sites in the Southwest, and by overlapping the tree ring patterns from the beams with his established chronology, he was able to date those sites. And once Douglas had dated some initial sites in the Southwest, that opened up the whole archeological world to dating many of the abandoned uh, Indian ruin sites in the American Southwest. Later, Dr. Douglas established the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona, where he worked well into his 90s. His efforts at extending the tree ring chronology further back into time were carried on by a young graduate student named Edmund Schulman. Schulman searched the arid west for trees old enough to push back the tree ring chronology. In 1953, he ventured into the White Mountains of California to seek out what were rumored to be very old trees. He took several samples and returned to his lab at the University of Arizona. To his astonishment, he found that he had broken not only the 3,000-year-old barrier, but had discovered the world's first known 4,000-year-old tree, still living today here in the forest. Obviously, he was very excited about making such a find and came back for the next four summers looking for an even older tree and uh, his searches were rewarded. He found another tree, the one we now call the Methuselah tree, uh, supposedly the oldest tree in the world at 4,733 years old. 
Unfortunately, Dr. Shulman died suddenly at the age of 49 of heart disease but his research provided the basis of what would become the longest continuous tree ring chronology in the world. One of Shulman's assistants, Dr. Wesley Ferguson, would continue working on this chronology. Every now and again, the tranquil seclusion of the bristlecone pine is rudely shattered by a brilliant tree ring scientist, Professor Charles Wesley Ferguson, whose mission in life is to hunt for better specimens of the tree to which he's dedicated his career. Dr. Ferguson focused on the tree ring patterns of the downed and dead wood. The decomposition here in the White Mountains is so minimal that this wood can lay on the ground for thousands and thousands of years. And it was Dr. Ferguson who was able to marry up the tree ring patterns of the dead and down wood with Dr. Uh, Shulman's patterns of the live wood, by overlapping them, he was able to extend Shulman's chronology to 7,000 years in length. Thousands of years takes is a lot of, of time, and this brings us up to the ADBC time period. By continuing research in the ancient bristlecone pine forest, scientists such as Tom Harlan hope to extend the continuous tree ring chronology all the way back to the last ice age in California, some 10 to 12,000 years ago. We have trees here in the Whites that are right at 5,000 years old. But by overlapping the ring patterns of these trees with the dead wood, we can go further back in time. So we currently go back to the year 6,700 BC, 8,700 years ago, and then we have a gap. And then there's another 3,000 years that are earlier. Every year, Tom Harlan comes to the White Mountains to look for this missing piece of wood that will connect the entire 12,000 year tree ring chronology. We're looking for the very elusive little piece that is just under 8,700 years to nine to 10,000 years ago. It's a lot of fun, it's a puzzle, trying to figure out where these things are. This tree ring chronology gives us important clues about past climatic and environmental events, which in turn gives us critical information to interpret present day climate patterns. This field of study is known as dendroclimatology. Dendroclimatology is a technique for extracting clues about the climate of the past from the annual rings that we find in living trees, such as bristlecone pine. And so scattered around the landscape, we have these natural archives of past environment that we can compile into annual maps of climate for very large regions, and indeed even now for the whole of the Northern Hemisphere, back for at least several hundred years. Having survived thousands of seasons of fire and ice, the incredibly durable bristlecone wood literally erodes more than it decays. But this remarkable ancient wood provided scientists with more than just a tree ring record of weather and environmental conditions. It also revolutionized our understanding of history. During the 50s, scientists relied on radiocarbon dating to determine the age of artifacts and archeological discoveries. They later realized that this process had some anomalies and needed to be calibrated. So in order to calibrate it or to check that radiocarbon dating process, they had to find uh, some objects that were organic, in other words, that were living at one time. And the oldest known thing that scientists could date exactly were the bristlecone pines from Shulman Grove. By radiocarbon dating examples of bristlecone pine wood with a known age, scientists were able to establish a calibration factor for the radiocarbon dating process. In turn, Archaeologists found that some artifacts discovered in Europe, such as Stonehenge, were actually 1,000 years older than previously thought. This challenged the long-held belief of cultural diffusion, that all civilization grew out of Mesopotamia. 
Archaeology has had to do some major rethinking. In, the, in Europe, they used to believe that there was a center of civilization which spread outwards and everything had to be younger as you got further away from that center because it couldn't have been there before and that's been turned on its head. Now with accurate dates of many artifacts, historians and archaeologists realize that it was far more likely that civilization grew simultaneously in many different regions. Because the bristlecone pines provided the wood to calibrate the radiocarbon dating method, they have become known as the trees that rewrote history. So you can see these trees are more than just a biological curiosity because they live to be these great ages in very, very poor conditions. They're actually teaching us something about the very emergence of modern mankind. When you think about the impacts of modern civilization and realize that many of the old ancient trees had already been growing when the pyramids were starting to be built. These trees were old trees even before all that. Truly is a very special place. I consider it a real privilege to have worked here for so many years. Hope to continue for a few more like these old trees. Here is a core that's 4,000 years long, and I look and see where I was born, and it's right out there on the outside, and where my grandfather was born, and that's way out there on the outside, and our whole history. The United States, nah, nothing compared to the life of these trees. It's really very awe-inspiring. <laughs>